Luc, since when do you know the Louvre? Uh, since I was a kid. Yes, yes. you came? Yes, when I was uh, 12 or something. Okay, and what was your feeling the first time? It's, it's huge, very big. It's, uh, it's still huge, in a way. <laughs> you are bigger, but it's still big, right? I'm older, yeah, but uh, it's still a very megalomaniac enterprise. So. And when you were 12, you thought you would become a painter? No, not really, that's too young. But I was interested in images and I drew a lot. And also took away some images probably from the Louvre, like the raft of Jericho, for example, which was for me then as a kid, of course, gigantic. Uh-huh. The raft of what? Of Cherico. Okay. Yeah. But it was here? Huh? It was here? I don't know, I suppose so, no? Mm -hmm. No? I don't know. No. Okay. But uh, what was the biggest image you remember from that time? It's the strongest. The big, biggest, the strongest image I remember from that time was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> You have the, the, the you have the huge painting opposite of the of the Mona Lisa, which you can't miss, of course. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. But the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa, I, yeah, I saw it, but it doesn't didn't really uh, enter in that way. That took more time. And uh, so this time is a different story. They invited you at the Louvre. Yeah. So when they invited you, what did you think? Well, to, first of all, it's a privilege to do it. That's one thing. And it's also a challenge to do it. And mm -hmm. I'm very happy that I was able to get the space that I wanted, which is the, the Rotonde de Valentin. It's also a little bit on the bridge between the Flemish school, the French school. And, uh, and, and, and to do this, this, this sort of murals that will disappear within a year. Yeah, but I don't understand why they wanted to vanish. Because that's also a little bit my idea, is the idea of an ephemeral artwork, an artwork that will only remain in, in, in the memory. You, know, as you like it? I, I did that before, I made about 85 of those things, so it's not the first time. But uh, um, you propose that it vanish in one year? Yeah, that was our m mutual understanding, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You, you want your work to vanish? No, but this specific work, which is like a public uh, work, which has a, then again gets a different sense, a different sense of temporality, a different sense of coherence within the way it shows itself. I mean, to show this permanently, I think, would be stupid in a way. And you did it yourself? What? To paint so largely on the walls? Yeah, of course. Everything? Yeah. No assistant? No. Well, somebody who drives the scissor lift. Yeah. Yes. But not the painting. No. And um, what is it about? What is it about? Okay, the good question. So, first of all, it's, there, there's three, paint, three wall paintings that are very much related to each other. Okay. You see the one with the hand behind you. There you see the other hand. But this actually... <coughs> And it comes from a YouTube uh, film that uh, well, there was actually two. Uh, you probably also saw it because you interviewed me for the show Eternity at David Swerner. Oui. It was a diptych of two hands, a guy cleaning his palette, which was called gloves. Mm -hmm. And so it was a New Zealand painter. And I was not so much interested in the, the work of the painter, but mostly about the aftermath where you see him cleaning his palette. And also the fact that they used Nike gloves to do that and had this sort of apron on which you saw the, 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 the sort of like spots of red, which then in a sense had something surgical nearly or something like a, a crime scene, something that was had to with a certain amount of violence. And that's where I took these close-ups from. And this time I didn't want to show the palette, I just wanted to show the hand and I wanted to show a certain element of movement and create them into an atmospheric situation. And, tr and then came the idea to pierce that with another work, which is the, after which the whole project is called, 
Dauphin or the Orphan, because that was the title of a small work, but 30 by 40 centimeters, that I lost from, from the 1990s. But how do, did you lose a painting? It was sold by my dealer to somebody else, and we just lost it. Ah. And, and so we never were able to retrace it. I mean, even for the catalog prisoner, it's more than 600 paintings, as well as six or seven that we can't, couldn't retrace, and that's one of them. How, how many paintings have you done? Uh, more than 600 paintings, so they're in the catalog prison. Okay. And so, so this is one of them that we couldn't find. Maybe it will search again after this show, who knows. But, uh, uh, so it's about a vanishing project? Huh? It's about a vanishing project that vanished already? In a sense, that's a link you could also make, yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Also the fact, of course, that it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a, dot, a doll's head from the back, where you see the neck, which is very vulnerable. It also has to do, seeing the fact that it's like cut at a certain level with the element of decapitation. And in a sense, that's good for the Louvre because, as Bataille said, when the guillotine was invented, this place became a public institution. So that's <laughs> the link. There's a lot of stories of decapitation in France. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, so, so there's a lot of ways to get into it. So for the visitors who yeah. pass by here, is there, do you expect a special feeling? About well, I, th I think the one thing is the beautiful thing is that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sort of passageway. It opens up to different rooms, which it already was before I did the thing here. And now they're going to be confronted with a different scale. And you already see that because when I was working here, people were, of course, taking selfies of me working on it, but also stopping a little bit in their tracks because all of a sudden they didn't know what that actually was. So it's like disorientating them, which I think is interesting. It's also the large blow-ups of, uh, of, of, of details, in a sense. And so that makes the disorientation, once it's clear, because yesterday you had it clear for just to look at it, then that becomes more opulent and then even more clear. But uh, shall it become clear when we look at that, for example? Because there's only part of the subject. Yeah, well, you, it's also the idea that you have a deconstructed image that is re reconstituated by putting it on the wall. So there is an element and a game between the idea of what is visual, what is figuration, and what is abstraction. So they just fer merge into each other. And, uh, and uh, the only thing that doesn't do it is the frontality of the, of the head. So that's pretty clear. So. And uh, in, when do you think when do you think that a painting is achieved, is good? When I did, when I reached my limits. And here you, you raised your limits? I worked to the point where I thought it was the best I could do. I mean, so we also prepared it, you know, because we worked, we worked with the different paints because they cannot, they cannot, because of the dust, so, I couldn't work, normally I do these things in acrylic, but that gives a structure. So that means I had to adapt them. I found a different paint, which is the paint that they use in theater in, the, in decors. Ah. And that has a highly uh, rotation of pigment, but that also will evaporate within a year. <gasps> this is crazy. It will evaporate well, within a year? Well, sort of diminish itself. It will, it will be more pale? Yeah. But. A lot of artists like Braque and Twombly have done things that will last here forever, as long as the museum will stay. Yeah, but the, the funny thing is that uh, Braque maybe did this little thing in the ornament and made this thing into an ornament. And so I Twombly painted it on the floor and then it was, put, it was put on the ceiling. This is the first time the walls are really addressed to. Yeah, but it's a corridor. It could have last. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it's better that it doesn't. I mean, that the paintings come back. I mean, that, that, that there is a sort of memory of something that has been. And, and that's how it's conceived. I mean, otherwise I would have done something different. So. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a strange idea to do something for it vanished, no? No, it's not. It's actually beautiful. It's, it's the idea of, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's also beautiful. I mean, I, I always have the, the idea and the dream that be, the first time I will see my work completely neutral will be when I'm completely demented, so. 
What does it mean? That I don't know what I'm fucking looking at. <laughs> and so, uh, what is really your aim with this installation? The aim of this installation is, first of all, to work in a major institution that is very megalomaniac and to do something that has a large scale, but at the same time is extremely vulnerable and will vanish. Uh, and are you megalomaniac? Not in the way some French people are, no. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are megalomaniac, Belgian style? Yes, a little bit as my predecessor Van Eyck had a motto, and he actually has a beautiful work now here. Who? Van Eyck. Yes. And he has, a great, he has a great motto, he has, if I can, which means I'm big on humility, but behind that, there are gigantic ambitions. So that's the thing I'm talking about. And what is your next big ambition? Well, the next project is a show in China that has been postponed for four times because of COVID and will finally happen in November. Where? In the UCCA at Beijing. Ah, super. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm waiting for that. Yeah. I will come and see you. Okay. Merci. Chez chez.